Assalamu alaikum and minglaba. I welcome you all to IPRI's international seminar in collaboration with Myanmar Institute of Strategic and International Studies. The topic in discussion today is Gandharan Civilization and Buddhist Heritage of Pakistan. For opening remarks, I would like President IPRI, Ambassador Dr. Reza Muhammad, to kindly share. Uh, 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 good morning to everyone who is here and all those who are online. I especially extend a very warm welcome to Ambassador Tan Cha, Chairman, Myanmar Institute of Strategic and International Studies. And also, Mr. Acha, who is Managing Director and CEO of Rubyland Tourism Services Company, Myanmar, and Dr. Pimpa Cha, Professor, Department of Archaeology, University of Yangon, Myanmar. Uh, Dr. Umar Tarad, he, he is Gandhara Chair, University of War. He is likely to join us soon. And Dr. Kumar, Amini, Patron Chief of the Pakistan Hindu Council, will also join us. And we're lucky to have online with us Dr. Shahid. He is already there. So welcome to everyone here. Uh, before we begin with the proceedings of today's seminar, uh, I would like to say a few words on Buddhist heritage in Pakistan and Buddhism. We started reading about Buddhism and Mahatma Buddha, as we call him, or Gautam Buddha, when we were in primary schools. I went through his teachings very deliberately in those young days, and I still have very fond memories of those days. I remember that uh, we went into the history and studied that uh, when the Mahatma Buddha or Gautam Buddha was conceived, his holy mother, Umaya Devi, dreamt of this conception that some angel came and she conceived. And it took about 10 months when the holy figure was born and came into this world. Uh, when he came into this world, their, his parents, uh, they thought that he is going to be the next Raja or King of the their kingdom, and he would inherit everything from them. Uh, and for this, they kept him away from the world, and they kept him inside the uh, palace. He had teachers who would come and teach him there, and he would be taught about the how would he become a king, how would he rule this uh, country and all that. It was very late, when he was about uh, 19 years of age, that he started knowing about the world. And when he was 29, uh, he came across two, three things. He saw an old man and asked his chariot uh, rider or chariot controller, who is he? He said he is an old man and we all have to come to this life, a very frail life. Then he saw a priest or monk sitting on one side and he asked him, who is he? And um, what is he doing there? He was told that the people who want to search for the truth and connect with the God, they leave everything and they just sit and give up all the pleasures of the world and try to connect with God. The third thing which, which he saw was that there was a, we uh, welcome uh, Dr. Umar Tarad. So the third thing he, was, he saw was that a dead body was being carried for the crimination. So he came to know that was the end. So he started thinking on that. He was married very early with a very, very beautiful lady. He had a uh, child also. But one night on when he was 29, 29 years of old, he left everything and went out and left and went for search of the truth. And then 
it is said that there was a Bodhi tree under which he sat for 49 days and 49th day he saw the lights and then he started off with his teaching. And when we see his teachings, his teachings and the teachings of Holy Christ, uh, as I read them, I may be wrong because many scholars are sitting here. I'm not that good a scholar on the religion and also on the uh, uh, Buddhism. Uh, but uh, the teachings of Mahatma Buddha and the teachings of Holy Christ match a lot. And sometimes I think that maybe he was one of the prophets which were sent on the earth to give guidance to the people, give light to the people, teach them of humanity, teach them of how to live together, how to forgive each other, how to be uh, uh, sensitive to others' needs and not be very worldly, uh, but give up the world and look after people and be connected to the divine powers that is the God Almighty. About Pakistan and the heritage. Uh, this uh, the story what we are talking about is 2,500 years, about 2,500 years back or 400 years back uh, that Mahatma Buddha was born. Uh, the Buddhism came here and um, there is a triangle, if you see, it's a 100 meter triangle from north to south and east to west, it is about 70 uh, kilometers. So top is Bamiyan in Afghanistan. Then we have Takhpai in uh, KPK and Texla here. So this triangle was the one where the Buddhism flourished. And it flourished more when the kings of these places adopted Buddhism as religion. And I have read somewhere that there was one time that 8,400 monasteries, or as we say, the stupas were created. And these stupas, as you all know, are nothing, but these are the ones which have the relics from the Lord Buddha. And the monks are there, they meditate, they concentrate, and they uh, pray. As far as the um, uh, remains and the stupas in Texla are concerned, we know their name. These are Bhir Mound, Sirkap, and uh, uh, Dharmashala, and so many others. In Takhtbai, we have many stupas. We have lots of relics in Sawat Valley, lots of relics uh, when we are, you are traveling towards the northern areas. You come across these. All these are um, protected sites cultural heritage sites. Unfortunately, we had a time when we had terrorism in our um, Swat Valley and the Taliban tried to demolish the relics, but uh, fortunately they were not very successful in damaging these uh, relics and the Buddha's figures too much and these were restored. And Pakistan today welcomes all the people who come from various parts of the world, whether it is Japan, Korea, uh, Thailand, uh, uh, Myanmar, and so many other places uh, which have the uh, Buddhist uh, people, Buddhist believers. Uh, we are proud to have all these heritages and uh, Texla, as it used to be called in Burmese or in those times, Takshashila, was one of the biggest universities of those times. You had medicine being taught there, you had astrology being taught there, you had uh, uh, so many other things being taught there. And more prominently, Chanakya Kutalia, who wrote Arth, Arda Shastra or Arth Shastra, he was also uh, stationed in Texla and he wrote it for his king of that time. Um, it's a proud heritage. We perhaps uh, are not owning that much. And this when I am saying I'm not talking to the friends um, who are there from Myanmar side, I'm talking to the people who are sitting here and for us that we have to own this heritage very proudly despite uh, or in spite of the religion uh, which we have that is Islam here, we are all Muslims, but this cultural heritage, the historical heritage is a great asset which we must um, be proud of. And uh, with these few words, I hand over the podium back to our MOC and I'm very grateful to uh, Ambassador Tan Cho and uh, also grateful to the Myanmar Institute of Strategic Studies and International Studies for uh, planning, organizing, and co-hosting this webinar come seminar. 
we would love to do more of it in future. And thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. President, for your remarks. We will now request President MISIS, Ambassador Tan Chao, Chairman MISIS, for his opening remarks. Yeah, hello. It's okay. Yes, uh, you. Okay, thank you. Um, dear Ambassador Dr. Raza Mohammed, President of the Islamabad Policy Research Institute, IPRI. Distinguished speakers, Dr. Ramanesh Kumar, Dr. Omar Darat, Dr. P. Chu Chow, and uh, my friend uh, Ui Jo, who's from the uh, 26th Center. Also, um, the Colonel Imran Khan, the Defense Attache of the Embassy of Pakistan in Yangon. Meghlava to you all. I'm pleased that Nyama Aziz and the Islamabad Policy Research Institute could have this very interesting Zoom meeting on Gandhara civilization and Buddhist heritage of Pakistan. Thank you all the participants for today's attendance. I'm very glad to have an opportunity giving opening remarks. <laughs> this is the second meeting between our two think tanks after I took the chair of Myanmar ISIS and seminars happened within the last uh, few months. I'm delighted of our ongoing this useful cooperation. Also, I'd like to thank Colonel Imran Khan for giving his time and efforts to make this seminar happen. Without his initiative, we could not have such a meeting today. Dear <clears throat> Dr. Raza and participants, throughout history, great civilizations built with great efforts. They rose and fell, and they faded away for various reasons and became history, but not without trace. Their history, sites, culture, relics, etc., are researched, located, excavated, recorded, and preserved after many centuries. Not only respective dissidents, but historians and scholars from other parts of the world value those ancient civilizations as they contribute to the evolution of humankind. Pakistan's Gandhara civilization is one of them. When I learned about Gandhara civilization from Colonel Imran Khan, I just got excited. As a Buddhist myself, I know that Buddhism flourished there for over 1,000 years. I need or wanted to know more about this civilization. Today, we have all four speakers, two from Pakistan side and two from Myanmar. They are going to share us on their research, studies, and possible opportunities for wider cooperation on Gandhara civilization and Buddhist heritage from them. In Myanmar, you may have known about few, few civilization. It was between 200 BC and 900 AD. Few civilization and culture flourished over 1,000 years. There were three cities at few civilization. The few cities provided the earliest testimony of the introduction of Buddhism into Southeast Asia almost 2,000 years ago. And the attendant economic, social, political, and cultural transformation, which resulted in the rise of the first, largest, and longest lived urbanized settlements of the region up till the ninth century. These earliest Buddhist city states play a similar role in the process of 
transmitting the literacy, architectural, and ritual traditions of Bali based Buddhism to other societies in the sub region where they continue to be practiced up to the present. It's pity that both Myanmar and Pakistan lost their respective magnificent civilizations. Dear Ambassador Raza and participants, one of the objectives of this Zoom meeting is to promote religious tourism between Myanmar and Pakistan related to the old time civilization sites. The places where Gandhara civilization and Pew civilization existed once are definitely worth visiting, especially by Buddhists. In between Myanmar and Pakistan lie Nepal, where Prince Tegada was born, India, where Gautama Buddha attained Nirvana, and Sri Lanka, where also Buddhism still flourishes. If two agencies of Myanmar and Pakistan can attract Buddhists from each other country, plus these three countries and beyond, in cooperation with two agencies of respective countries, all will benefit. I would like to rec recommend that two agencies of our two countries establish contacts with a view of working in this regard and hoped that the speakers on tourism will come up with recommendations accordingly. <clears throat> I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chairman MISIS, for your opening remarks. We will now officially begin our discourse on the subject of Gandhara civilization and Buddhist heritage of Pakistan. Our first speaker for this session is Dr. Nadeem Umar Tar. Uh, he is the Gandhara Chair University of Wa, founder member of Gandhara Resource Center Pakistan. He served as the executive director for the Center for Cultural and Development Islamabad. He will be discussing with us on the Gandharan civilization and Buddhist sites in Pakistan. Sir, you may begin your discourse. Um, it's up to you. Can you please check on my... Yes. Uh, next slide, from the title, please. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Dr. Raza, and I'm also grateful to uh, you know, APRI and MISI, you know, Myanmar Institute of Policy and Strategic Studies, I guess. Yes. Uh, and I think it's a great initiative uh, that, uh, you know, the institutions which are concerned with the strategic studies of these uh, two countries have actually, uh, you know, come to talk about Gandhara civilization. Uh, let me... Uh, you know, sort of uh, first begin by setting a certain context to our present discussion so that you may realize that this present interest of the Pakistani government is not of recent phenomena. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. I would just sort of, uh, you know, draw your attention uh, to the state ownership of Pakistan's Buddhist heritage, which started right after partition. And if you look at these uh, stamps, you could see that they were before, uh, you know, uh, Pakistan uh, was sort of separated and Bangladesh uh, came to be. So uh, in these two uh, stamps actually testify to Pakistan state's sort of cultural ownership of this heritage, uh, you know, uh, assets. 
uh, and uh, uh, next please. And you would also know that uh, one of Pakistan's, uh, you know, very sort of illustrious ambassador, uh, Raja Tiridurai, who was also ambassador at large and also a federal minister in Pakistani uh, government in the 70s, he was the one who was from East Pakistan and uh, uh, belonged to the Chakma tribe. He was, uh, he was uh, uh, you know, the king of the Chakma tribe and also a great proponent of Buddhism in Pakistan. He, in fact, authored this book, Buddhism in Pakistan, in 1955. So that actually clearly established Pakistan government, you know, sort of uh, interests and its credentials uh, in, the, in this Buddhist heritage. Next, please. Now, uh, as you know, scholars have also, you know, sort of noticed this phenomenon. It's a very interesting article called the Pakistani Homeland for Buddhism. So, which tells you that from the 1950s and 60s, uh, Pakistani state institutions, especially its museums, began to showcase, next please, their, uh, their precious historical, uh, you know, cultural assets belonging to Gandhara civilization. Uh, and they were also sent abroad to Sri Lanka, to Thailand, to Korea, to Japan, and other countries uh, for a temporary exhibit. So I just want to, you know, clarify this impression that Pakistani state, uh, you know, has recently turned to Buddhism to reclaim its uh, national identity. I think it has all, it has been there all the way through. It is just that we probably tend to forget few things in our national life. And Buddhist civilization of Pakistan is just one of them. Next, please. Now, uh, the little time that I have, I will try and take you a uh, you know, quick overview of the built heritage uh, of uh, you know, belonging to Buddhism. And I must tell you that this uh, seminar is also titled very appropriately. It says Gandhara civilization and Buddhist heritage of Pakistan. Now, interestingly, Gandhara civilization is not the only civilization in Pakistan which has in which has inherited uh, Buddhism. You know, the entire Sindh and Punjab were also major centers of Buddhism, and we just uh, do not realize uh, that because they were not given the kind of prominence that the cultural assets in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa received. So, uh, next, please. So I think, uh, you know, Pakistan's Buddhist heritage goes way beyond Gandhara. But obviously, it is concentrated in Gandhara in, a, in an amazing manner. Next, please. So I have divided this presentation very, very quickly into three sections. Uh, in the end, I'll give you some recommendations, which also echo with what uh, the chairman uh, of Menam Ar Institute had uh, suggested. Now, uh, for those of you uh, uh, who needs to be reminded that Gandhara civilization had three major capitals, uh, Purushpura, which is Peshar, Pushka Kalavati, which is Charsada, and Tekshasila, uh, which is uh, now presently Tekshila. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know the, Gandhara, the region of Gandhara became an Achaemenian province in the 6th century BC. That is how the first historical reference uh, to this region came to be. And, and afterwards, uh, next please, you would see that, uh, you know, Gandhara, the region of Gandhara uh, was strategically located on a branch of, uh, you know, Silk Road. Thereby, you know, it became like, a, you know, almost like an epicenter of the exchange of ideas. You know, as you know, that when, when people travel on the road, ideas also travel. Invaders also take that road. So Silk Route has been taken by invaders as well as monks and merchants. And the, due to its strategic location, Gandhara became a hub of religious syncretism and cultural fermentation. Uh, of course, it was one of the Mahajanpada, the great regions of the, in India. And, and next, please. 
Now, uh, also, uh, those of you who are familiar with, uh, with Buddhist literature would recognize Jataka tales. Now, Jataka tales are the tales of the lives of, uh, you know, people lives of Lord Buddha. And we also mention a region called Gandhara. So that is why we know that it is not just our imagination uh, that gives so much prominence uh, to, to Gandhara, but actually uh, it had a lot of merit. And these two uh, Jataka tales that I have been able to identify, Telipatha Jataka and Gandhara Jataka, actually uh, talks about the character. You know, it is as if uh, Sakyamun Buddha had visited Gandhara in his previous life, though he had not visited actually in his physical life in 5th century BC, he never probably uh, came here. Next, please. Now, this is the uh, Talipatha Jataka, and uh, you could see that this particular Jataka is very famous. It is also, uh, you know, uh, painted in, in the Ajanta Kings and in also one of the kings in Sri Lanka. It talks about textiles, about the story of the king of textiles. Very fascinating story to be told. Next, please. Now, uh, as I said, you know, this is the, uh, the political history of Gandhara from the Achaemenians to the Hindu Shaya. So you could see that all of these guys, you know, after like even Greeks and Mauryans and Indo-Greeks and all these guys, they, uh, they you know, sort of gravitate toward Buddhism. So Buddhism had acquired ever since Ashoka, uh, um, you know, converted to Buddhism and then sent his missionaries Everywhere. Uh, he also sent his missionaries uh, to, to Gandhara. And you would also know that Ashoka was also the viceroy of Tesla for 10 years. So he had a very special fondness for Tesla. And Tesla was a place, I will tell you later, why it is so important a region within Gandhara. And which had to be turned into a flashpoint for Buddhist religious tourism in Pakistan. Next, please. Now, again, so these uh, three characters, Ashoka, Menander, and Kanishka, so they are the ones who are known as a great patron of Buddhism over the centuries. Next, please. Now, these are the Buddhist sites of the Buddhist heritage. Next, please. Now, if, if you look at the map, actually, there's a map that we have developed in the Gandhara Chair University of Wa, which gives, uh, you know, at least details of the selected sites, Buddhist sites in Pakistan. So if you look at the, at the map on your right, you would see that there's a color coding here. So most of the sites are concentrated uh, in Khyber Pakhtunkha, which is probably yellow, and then the another color and so on. So this is Khyber Pakhtunkha, Gilgit Basistan, Punjab and Sindh, right? Next, please. Now, this is a map copy of the map. It is available from our website. Anybody can download it and get to know about the our you know Buddhist heritage sites in Pakistan for religious tourism. Next, please. Next, please. I'm skipping because I have little time, so I want to get to the heart of it. Now, these are the museums, at least seven great museums which, uh, you know, showcase this Buddhist heritage uh, for the visitors. Next, please. Now, uh, and, and, and can you just kind of, uh, would like five second laps, please go on, run this whole show until I tell you to stop. Next, please. Uh, so these are different, uh, you know, just uh, like five seconds. Now, now these are the different uh, heritage sites that we have in Pakistan. Taktbai had been mentioned. It is uh, one of the uh, world heritage sites. Shatyal rock carvings in Gilgit-Bassistan. It is an amazing uh, example. Now, Tesla Museum. Uh, Bangala Stupa, again, a very, very sacred stupa. Dharmalajika Stupa is the one which is which is the oldest and considered the most sacred because this is where the ashes of the Lord Buddha have been deposited. So it is very, you know, profoundly sacred uh, for the Buddhists. Jodhya Monastery, next please. Now, these are the cities of Gandhara, which includes Sirkap as well. Sirkap is an Indo-Greek uh, city which was uh, you know established and uh, had actually a very multicultural character to it. Mankala Stupa, 
is in Rawalpindi. Now we're jumping to Sindh. Now this is the National Museum in Karachi, uh, which also have a great Gandhara collection. Next, please. Uh, and this is a stupa in Sindh in Mirukan. And you know, uh, you know, when when Buddhism declined in Gandhara, uh, it actually then prospered in Sindh. And by the time Muhammad bin Qasim arrived in Sindh, uh, you know, seventy percent of the population was Buddhist in Sindh. And I'll tell you how the descendant of those who uh, had lived in Gandhara still continue to live on, but we don't know. Nobody would miss this stupa at Monjdoro. But everybody would, you know, sort of sort of misplace it in a way that we only associate the site with Indus Valley. We do not see that there is a massive uh, Buddhist footprint here. And in fact, this was the stupa which drew the attention of the early uh, archaeologists here. And when they dug further, they realized that they could find the, uh, you know, artifacts of an ancient, uh, more ancient period. Uh, but we tend to forget, tend not to associate Mohanjadaro with Buddhism. Next, please. Now, so the Haranjadaro is another uh, stupa uh, in Sindh. And I, I must tell you that uh, stupas and monasteries in, in Khabar Pakhtuncha are built of stone. The stupa and monastery in Sindh are uh, made of uh, dried bricks. So as you know, the brick would not survive, would not last as a stone uh, would last much longer. So that is why we do not see much there. Next, please. Now, there were very, very quickly the artifacts excavated from the site, and some are supremely similar and uh, widely known. The fasting, uh, fasting Siddharth is one of the amazing miracles of Saravasti is also now, I just want to tell you that all of these sculptures, you must understand that, that they were not object of worship for Buddhists. They were the, actually the story birds, if you like, in contemporary terms. They were, the, uh, you know, it actually tells a Jataka tale or a story of, you know, some miracle performed by Buddha. Next, please. Right, these are the uh, characters which grew because of the Greek influence uh, in Gandhara. Next, please. Next, please. Hariti is another character in Buddhism, stucco head of Buddha. So, uh, Buddha and stucco head of a noble. And mind you, all these sculptures were colored, they were like gold plated. Yeah. Now we see them in a, in a devious form because they have been, you know, they have lost their glory, if you like. So uh, this is one of the rare examples uh, where in Asia you find actually the the, the, the color and the and the gold, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, tones uh, in the sculpture. Next, please. And now. Dipanka Jataka is another very really fascinating Jataka, which has now been illustrated in this relief sculpture. Now, so these relief sculptures, when a visitor would look at them, they would be able to recall the story of the life of Buddha. So they were for modern purpose, they were not as object of worship. And you know, if, if Buddhists were to worship uh, the idols, quote unquote, what difference uh, they would have uh, from uh, Brahmins. So, so Buddha was, very, as I'll tell you later, Buddha was firmly against his uh, portrait, his representation, his human likeness to be made. He strictly uh, forbid people. But, you know, and in Islam, there's a, probably a similar injunction against saint, but there are certain sects which tend not to follow that. So, so I think there's a lot in Buddhism that we have just taken for granted and not really looked at through any critical lens. Next, please, very, very quickly, please. Now, these are different parties. Let's go, please. This is for all function. Next, please, chal to jaye. Now, this is the heart of it. May I put it on a chat What are the historical and religious significance of Gandhara for the, for the world Buddhist? Right? These are the six points. And I will explain all these very six points very quickly. Now, you must understand, as Ambassador Saab has already uh, mentioned, that Tetsula University was a world oldest university. It's not the oldest university in India only, it's the oldest university in the world. 
And you must, you know, take some credit for that. And it was also significant for the development of Buddhism, but also for other arts, not only in a theological uh, institution, but, but in contemporary terms, it was a secular institution, right? And it predates Buddhism. Buddhism uh, came in the 5th century and arrived in uh, Tekshala or Gandhara in a couple of centuries later, whereas uh, the Tekshala University is around maybe 900 BC onwards, right? Now, again, this region of Gandhara was very literate. There was this Khrushchev, which was a derivative script of Aramaic, which Akhmenian had brought for administrative state communication. So that provided very literate base. And most of, uh, you know, uh, Buddhist, uh, you know, Buddha's uh, sort of teaching were also then transcribed in, in, um, in Khrushchev script. And those of manuscripts, I'll tell you, they're still found here. And they are the world of best manuscripts. They were found from Gilgit in the early 20th century, right? So likewise, the world of best manuscripts that we had, and also the following scripture of Buddhism, and then we have the most important point, the site of transmission of Buddhism to China and the East Asia. If this is World of Silk Road. And finally, home of translator of Buddhist text, right? You know, Ali, which is actually, um, you know, uh, followed in Sri Lanka, Pali is a language of Buddhist text. It's almost like what Arabic is to Quran, is to Pali, is to Buddhism. So it's a life sacred language, right? But at the same time, there's a whole lot in Khurishti, right? Uh, which is also carries uh, enormous uh, importance. And these, in fact, were the only texts done in Pali, because Pali came to be around 6th, 7th, 5th, maybe on the previous Pali. Sorry, please, what is there? Right. Uh, next slide, please. So, I mean, you know, so it is. Um, Textual, I'm coming back to the text language, the point one. So, 63 quotes, uh, Mahabharata was written here, uh, you know, Pali canon uh, was also found here. Next, please. Abhi, dekhi, ye, these are the people who are the alumnus of Texla University. So, Texla University is not a myth. It is something which has been granted by the historical records. And all the characters, Vishnu Sharma, Jyoti Pal, Sanjit, Charatha, and Jeevat, they were the alumni, uh, they studied at Texla University, uh, all kinds of subjects, and one was a great physician, the other was a, uh, you know, a grammar, was a woman. So they were rich Indian characters, or give all the cheese and cheese. Uh, Hassan, our connection is loose to you? I think so, sir. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So, interesting uh, explanation. I think it is a Okay. Okay. So that we can issue. Sir. Thank you. No, not at all. So I was saying that, uh, for instance, you know, one of the, if you if you read the, uh, read through this slide, you will realize that Jeevak, a graduate of Texla University, was a physician to Gautama Buddha. You know, Sakya Muni Buddha's physician had studied here, right? Likewise, you must have heard of, uh, next slide, please. You must have heard of, you know, you know they are great names, but the greatest names are these, Panini and Chankya. Now, Panini is the one who actually gave some secret, uh, you know, uh, its grammar and he worked on phonology and linguistics. So he is the first man to deliberate the rules of language, right? So I think, and he, and he was born where he not only studied here, but he was also born in Salabi, a place called Chota Lahore, right? So I think if Pakistan can't take credit for these characters, maybe world is still your thunder in a way, right? And he wrote this very important book, which is one of the oldest linguistic and grammar texts of Sanskrit surviving in its entirety. Next, please. Now, Kotiliya Chankya, the great statesman. I think if Kotiliya was not there, you know, 
then probably uh, Mauryan Empire would not have existed. So not only that uh, Kotlin and Chankya, uh, you know, tutored uh, Chandrakut Maria in Texla, but he also then became an advisor to his government. And you know, when Mauryan Empire, uh, you know, was sort of established when they attacked Magadha, the truth went from Texla to Magadha. So Texla had a role to play in the legend of the first Indian Empire. And if you look at Earth Shasa, it's a, I, I, I would say it's a must reading uh, for, for the diplomats as well, for the statesman and for the strategists. Next, please. Now, I was saying number two point the founding scriptures of Gandharan Buddhism uh, were found here. And, you know, they were in birch bark. So, birch bark manuscripts survived and they survived because of the weather in Gilgit. And, and, and next, please, now, Gilgit manuscripts, which are not here, by the way, in Pakistan, they are in India and elsewhere in the world, because of obvious reasons. Uh, it means it's Pakistan, so that is why it will not uh, arrive here. So it's around, I think, 1920s or something when they were 12, when they were discovered. Anyway, so getting ahead of the story, what I'm saying is that this initial discovery of this manuscript also created uh, intellectual revolution uh, in, the, in the Buddhist studies because uh, they provided insights which were not there. Next, please. Uh, these are some of the images uh, of those manuscripts. This is a cover box. And is, this is the actual page here. Next, please. Now, this is also, again, the third point. The site of transmission of Buddhism to China. As I earlier said, because it has strategically located on the branch of the Silk Route, so they were all connected. You know, monasteries in Bamiyan were connected with monasteries in Gilgit. And 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 then all the uh, monasteries were also connected. So there was a uh, pilgrimage circuit as well. And uh, you know, the, these uh, Chinese, next please, who came to uh, Pakistan. Achha, again, the more ancient Pakistan, the home of translators of Buddhist text. It's extremely important to realize that these, uh, you know, Malanda traveled to Korea. Lokaksina was the first person who brought Buddhism to China in a way that he translated those texts in the Chinese language. Janam Gupta, 6th century, and Paranja in 9th century. There were all these Buddhist monks from Gandhara who then uh, traveled along the Silk Route, went to China, and the Chinese emperor had showed a great interest in Buddhism, and they became the interpreter and the translator of Buddhist text. Right? Next, please. Now, uh, likewise, Chinese Buddhists, as you know, also traveled in, uh, and these are the two uh, great names. Uh, next, please. Now, the home of Second Buddha, this is really the gem. Because nobody realizes that in Buddhism, there is a character called Padma Sambhava and Guru, and also called Guru Rana Poshi. They are, they are revealed almost probably more than Sakya Buddha. And he hailed from Savat, Udhyana, right? And he went to Tibet and established the first monastery there. So all the Buddhists who come here in, to Pakistan, they are reciting Padma Sambhava Sutra and Padma Sambhava is our guy. And we don't recognize him. And next, please. And finally, I'm saying the site of the anthropomorphic representation of Buddha. You know, as I said in the beginning, next, please. This is how Buddha was represented, you know, anaconic. You know, you, you don't make an image. You create an icon to represent him. You say, alam hai, right? So likewise, this iconic footprint and, uh, you know, his throne and stupa, and these were the symbols uh, which... I kind of represented Buddha, not his figure. It is only in Gandhara and Mathura where the representation of Buddha were to be made. So this is again comes, and, and you know, that is why there is such a thriving uh, Buddhist culture tradition in Pakistan even today. Next, please. So this is my last bit, just very, very quick recommendations. Uh, it is it is it is more to us and to our friends in the world that you know ninety seven percent of the world Buddhist population lives in the Asian continent. 
you know, if you think of Sark, what connected Sark, now I realize, is Buddhist legacy. All the countries in the Sark have Buddhist histories. So this, these are the kind of bonds of friendship that we need to cultivate. These are the, you know, uh, these are the forgotten memories of our shared past that we need to rekindle. And how can it can be done? Next, please, I would really urge you that Pakistan need to create a Buddhist circuit of Gandhara. You know, there is something called, you know, Buddhist circuit, which is India, Nepal, bit of Sri Lanka. We need to have a Gandhara circuit. We need to take, uh, you know, Buddhist monks from Sin to via uh, Punjab to KP and maybe, if possible, to Bamiyan if we have uh, cultivated relations with, with Afghanistan. So this is very important. And secondly, if our, you know, partners in Buddhist countries, if they start branding Pakistan as a custodian of Buddhist heritage, I think it will then, you know, signal the world that Pakistan is, a, you know, is a safe haven for Buddhism. And Buddhism, uh, barring the uh, weaponization of religion, which has taken place everywhere, you know, Islam has been weaponized. So I think Buddhism. So that is not something unusual. But what we, in order for to, uh, you know, bring peace, I think we need to hi highlight, uh, you know, these sectors which unite us rather than those things that divide us, right? So likewise, I would say the tour operators, as Chairman has earlier said, should be really encouraged to start, uh, you know, bringing tours to Pakistan. And, you know, why they don't know? Because I have seen that Pakistan has not produced, yes, there is some content in English language, which people like myself and loads of other scholars have produced. But there is very little content in foreign languages. About Gandhara, in the languages of the Buddhist countries. How many books or articles or even brochures or maps do we have in Japanese and Korean and, you know, Sengali or whatever? We do not have what is needed here. The kind of infrastructure, the info based certainly. Next, please. So, so this is again a million dollar idea. Celebrate Visakh Day in Pakistan. As you could see from these pictures, we have done it on our own as a very small organization. You know, on the, I can you know, go because now is 10 55. My time was 10 40 to 10 55. So, if you allow me, then I can leave the meeting. Because it's too much to, at 11 o'clock is another my meeting. So now the 10.55 have uh, done. Yes. I was here for my speech at 10.40 to 50. That's my, uh, sir, that's my last point. That we need to work. But uh, it is not because I already told uh, the committee member that I have another meeting. So please, I will be there from um, 10 o'clock till uh, 11 o'clock. So they said, confirm me that your speech will be between 10.40 and 10.55. May I, sir? Right. I'm just uh, concluding on this note that we need to hold Visakh Day. And there is a body called International Council for Visakh Day, which, which can be invited to hold the Visakh celebration in Pakistan. It will generate a lot of publicity and actually will, uh, will initiate this religious tourism in a very big way. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Nadeem. And since uh, Dr. Ramesh Kumar is short on time, I would like him to uh, take the honors to share his points on the faith of terrorism. He is an MA and patron in chief of the Pakistan Hindu Council. Sir, please, you may go ahead. Thank you very much. A warm hello, good morning and namaste to everyone. First of all, I would like to pay my gratitude to the Islamabad Policy Research Institute for organizing the webinar on such an important topic. That is actually very close to my heart. It is a matter of great privilege and honor for me to interact with the honorable scholars 
from Pakistan and especially from the Myanmar, which I have visited 10 years back, who are expert in Gandhara civilization, especially the presence of guest scholar from Myanmar today in this webinar shows commitment for preservation of Buddhist heritage of Pakistan. In fact, I was the first one in Pakistan who highlighted the importance of promoting faith tourism in the country and is still pursuing it constantly through my writings published in national newspaper. Simply, anyone may do Google on the internet to find that on various forums. I suggested including religious tourism, Buddhist Gandhara tourism in our national priorities for boosting the economy, projecting a good image of our beloved homeland, homeland Pakistan, and strengthening friendly relations with Buddhist majority countries of Myanmar and Asia Pacific. I am grateful to everyone who gave me such positive feedback in this regard and endorsed my viewpoint that if the government of Pakistan concentrates only on the promotion of faith tourism, we can improve our, our image globally, earn a large amount of foreign exchange in a short period of time and also get rid of foreign debt. No doubt, the 2,000-year ancient Gandhara civilization belonging to the northern part of the present-day Pakistan reflects Buddhism glorious past in our region. Present-day Pakistan was once considered a significant center of Gandhara ancient Buddhist civilization that extended from 1st century to the 7th century Many Buddhist monuments and worship places are located here in Pakistan in various places from Texla to Sawad. It is therefore the desire of every Buddhist in the world to visit sacred sites located in Texla, Takhtebai, Sawad, Gilgit, Baltistan, and other Pakistani areas. Historians are of the view that the first sculpture of Buddha was created in the region now called Pakistan. The ancient city of Texla is the most important holy place in the eyes of Buddhists, where the world's most ancient dynasty was established in Texla. And great philosopher Chankya used to teach students. Even today, his book, including Arthashastra, and Chankya Niti are most popular with huge readership throughout the world. Chankya is a world-renowned philosopher of Gandhara era, but unfortunately he is being portrayed as a negative character here in Pakistan. However, through my writings, I am trying my best to remove misunderstanding about him and I am glad that now many Pakistani people are also acknowledging him positively. Recently, Chief Buddhist Monika Sangha, Supreme Council of Thailand, most venerable Arya Vangasu has performed a three months religious ritual in Texla. This was really a good development as far the first time in the history of Pakistan. A highly influential Buddhist leader has selected this region to visit with his followers, which I consider to be a great step towards the promotion of Gandhara civilization. A special ceremony was held to mark Kathina rituals at the end of the rainy season, in which diplomatic envoys of Indonesia, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Myanmar, and several other Buddhist majority countries of the Far East participated on this occasion. The Buddhist participants turned Pakistan a peace-loving country and acknowledged that the followers of different faiths are enjoying freedom to celebrate their religious festivals. 
Similarly, last year, Buddhist tourists from Sri Lanka came to Pakistan for pilgrimage to various historical and religiously important sites associated with the Buddhist dominated Gandhara civilization. A few years ago, the arrival of Korean Buddhist monarch in Gilgit Baltistan also attracted the attention of Pakistani media. It was considered to be the first time when a group of Buddhist monarchs visited the northern region of Pakistan to perform religious rituals. Recently, some news reports also surfaced in the media that Korea is interested in supporting the establishment of Gandhara International University in Texala. I proposed the same five years ago to establish a world-class international university in Texla in honor of ancient philosopher Chankya. The hostels of the proposed university can be vacated during the summer vacation and handed over to the Buddhist tourists for spending the rainy season in the historic city of the Texla. Today, it is believed that over 7% of the world population approximately 520 million people is composed of Buddhist, several Asian countries including Japan, Korea, China, Myanmar, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, Sri Lanka, Singapore, Bhutan, Laos, India, Mongolia are having largest Buddhist population. In China, 18% of the population consisting of around 244 million people is Buddhist. Very good number of followers of Buddhism reside in Russia, United States and other Western countries. However, in Pakistan, according to the Pakistan Hindu Council, the welfare organization I established in 2005, the Buddhist population is rapidly decreasing day by day. Currently, the number of Pakistani Buddhist citizens only 1,741 people, including 13 transgenders. It is according to my Pakistan Hindu Council research. The majority of Buddha's followers are living in extreme poverty in Sindh province. In my view, if attention is paid to the education and training of Pakistani Buddhists, they can play the role of bridge with Buddhist majority countries. And I can help in this because I know all of our land. During my foreign tours, especially to Asia Pacific countries, I observe that there is a huge demand for Buddha statues that are currently produced in Pakistan all over the world. In Texla, there are many talented sculptors who learned the art of making statues from the ancestors. According to the international media reports, their hard work is just paid by 2000 while Pakistani scriptures are being sold in the international black market for above $10,000. This is my sincere wish that the laws about producing copies and replicas of Buddha statues must be revised. The statues of Gautama, Buddha with the label made in Pakistan would not only generate huge foreign exchange from the global market, but also, our positive image would be projected in the world. Undoubtedly, Pakistan has potential to become an attractive country for Buddhist tourists from all over the world. In my view, faith tourism it is the most important initiative that has potential to bring people of Pakistan and Buddhist majority countries closer. However, it is necessary from Pakistan side to take at least three steps on priority basis which I have suggested since long. Firstly, establishment of a regulatory authority for promotion of religious tourism in Pakistan. Secondly, to legalize the export of Buddha statues. And thirdly, the establishment of an international university in Trexla in the name of a great philosopher, Chankyaji, the most famous, influential, and intellectual Gandharan personality. I believe that Gandhara heritage is a symbol of international peace and the order to promote interfaith harmony and attract foreign tourists from the Myanmar 
and other Buddhist majority countries. I am always available to play my active role and look for other like-minded individuals and organization to join hands with me for this noble cause. I again congrats the team of the organization, organizers, Islamabad policy research who have organized this event and uh, uh, with this important topic, which is very, very close my heart. I don't want to take extra time because my time was 15 minutes by, and that's why I want to uh, my, end my speech before the time, not after the time that nobody can wait for me. Thank you very much. Regards all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Amish, for your discourse. Uh, we will now be moving on to our panelists from Myanmar. Uh, Dr. Pin Pyo Shao, he's the professor of Department of Archaeology in the University of Yangon, Myanmar. Sir, please, you may begin your discourse. The topic assigned to him was on Gandhar civilization, history, and culture. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, could you please let me share my pre presentation? Everybody can can see? Yes, sir, we are able to see your presentation and you're also audible. Okay. okay. Uh, today, uh, first of all, I just want to uh, thank you uh, for attending and uh, <clears throat> I'm very happy to be invited uh, to attend and share my knowledge for the uh, researchers and uh, scholars. My uh, title is mainly focused on the Buddhist iconography related to the context of history and culture. It is uh, mainly originated to the Gandhara civilization. Okay, I, I, I think all of the attendees can see my presentation. Uh, uh, Kandara is a very uh, huge and very great civilization of the Asia. So especially for the Buddhist uh, tradition and Buddhist art. So we can uh, study uh, since I was, in, I was a student in my university. Uh, we very interesting and very, very uh, specialized to study the an iconic period of the Buddhist society. In that time, the most of the school of Buddhist art mainly focused on the symbols, symbols represented for the unrivaled Buddha. So, on the further brief uh, explanation of the, uh, sorry, for the brief explanation of the uh, Gandhara civilization, it was uh, the expansion of the Persian, uh, abrasion of the Alexander, and the establishment of the uh, Maurya Empire is the great event, event of the part of regional political history in that uh, <coughs> the associated area of the uh, Gandhara civilization. So according to the literature reviews, I, I have <coughs> collected some data for Gandhara place. The main centers of Gandhara is Pakistan, Aswat, Pashkalavati, and Takshila. Now we call Takshila. So so it was uh, <coughs> it was put it and put it an end to the Gandhara by the invader or hunt invader or intruder. So especially for the pattern of the Gandhara civilization, we recorded the Buddhist Kushan kings, Kanishka. They are the most nobles of the rulers in Gandhara civilization. So the area <coughs> covered by the Gandhara civilizations in the present day, uh, not only by the present day, but also uh, Northeast of Afghanistan and Southwest of Asia. So the archaeological sites of the Indus Valley civilization, very uh, great for one of the 
four great river civilizations of the world uh, civilized societies, uh, the archaeological sites of Indus Valley civilization. Uh, uh, as we know, the Mohanjo Daro, uh, Harappa, and the Maharaka. So, this Asian society is mostly uh, related to the recent, uh, uh, the later Gandhara civilization. So, it's followed, uh, it's followed and uh, related, related to each other. So, first of all, I just want to uh, explain about the, the first Buddha image. It's very interesting point of the Buddhist study and Buddhist iconography. And the Kanishka was the emperor of the Kunshan dynasty. Uh, when, he, when his range, uh, he climbed, he meant the climb uh, uh, with the two pages. Uh, the, 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 the obvious one is his his picture, the vision, and another one is a bit of the, the Buddha standing images like this. And the next, uh, and another kind of coins, uh, the, 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 the obvious one is the Kanishka, and another one is the Shiva, uh, Shiva, <laughs> Shiva the vision. It's very interesting. So before that, uh, create. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Sir, you Yes, okay. Any presentation? Okay, okay, okay. It's okay, let, let me continue. Okay, thank you. So after, after a thousand years, after a thousand years later, uh, <laughs> Bagan was the epicenter of the Buddhist Missionary center in the Southeast Asia, especially in Myanmar. Uh, so, the Gandhara, Golden Age of the India, uh, India, we can we know uh, we we have known about that Gupta period, fourth to fifth century CE. So, Asian Pew style, Pew, <laughs> Asian Pew and Bagan style, Pew and Bagan style style in Myanmar related to do so. Buddha style, Buddhist, Buddhist iconography. So, uh, for example, this the Machakra Buddha's images is very popular in Myanmar, uh, not only in the ancient time, but also in the recent time. So, this is uh, mostly, this is totally uh, different from the Gandhara, European, uh, Greek, Greek Roman style, and it's mainly uh, related to the Indian native. Uh, Buddhist, Buddhist, Buddhist iconography. So, so mature style is not uh, so much like uh, Gandhara, uh, that uh, as European style that so we can see, we can call the reali realistic representation of the uh, Buddha as a real man and a real, a real referee, real clothes and something like this. In material style, Buddha's Buddha image images as a very, very mostly symbolized with the decoration ornaments and the uh, representation for the esteem of uh, all the powerful, for the prestige uh, of the Buddhist uh, tradition and the doctrine. So this is 
So this is from the Yama uh, first millennium uh, Buddhist tradition. We call the Sri, Sri Krishna view city. So now it was inscribed in the World Cultural Heritage in 2014. Uh, pure style of Buddha image. This is the, <laughs> this was embossed on the silver container. Uh, so we can, we can <laughs> easily look at that style is very close to the, close to those of the crypto style of art. Another one is the sandstone uh, Buddha images. It was Buddha image. It was uh, it was found in the inside the uh, Sri Kishore Asian city. Now displayed in the Sri Kishore Museum. So according to the attributes and the attitude of this style of uh, carving, the style of sculpture, we can see the Dhrana Mudra is uh, represented for the meditation and the Parinkasana in the last position, very comfortable way. Uh, to sit for a long time for to to meditate, so it's mainly it it is uh, uh it is it is uh it can it can be uh related to those of uh, Sri Lanka and Nuradha Pura uh, periods. So it is a contemporary of the Sri Kishra and Nuradha Pura in <laughs> and Nuradha Pura in uh, Sri Lanka. So this another one is the high relief. High relief stone slab uh, now displayed in Sri Kishore Museum. So it also shows the relationship of the uh, Indian style of the Buddhist uh, iconography uh, as well as those of uh, Sri Lanka. So it is a small type of the Buddhist depiction. So we call the terracotta body tablet related to, it, it, it can be related to the style of Pala, 10th, 11th century, uh, between the Bengal and the mainland of Myanmar. So this division is very, uh, uh, very <laughs> artistic and uh, co completely uh, described about the Chataka of uh, Buddhist Chataka. So in this, in this division, in this Buddhist tablet, so we see the eight sinners, eight sinners of Buddhist biography, the life of Buddha. Uh, for example, nativity, enlightenment, reaching of the salmon, that is the great deceive and the taming of the elephant, something like this. So this slide uh, can correlate between Myanmar, uh, began standing Buddha images and the uh, Sri Lanka, Poluna River, is a contemporary of the Bagan period. <laughs> so uh, the, the, the school of Buddhist art and Buddhist iconography was originated at the Northwest India and Pakistan area and uh, gradually uh, transformed and gradually changed, <laughs> gradually transformed to, uh, to reach the southern, southern path gradually to reach, uh, it's gradually arrived to uh, to be uh, developed in the Sri Lanka. In the same time, the eastern part of the India continent, so like in Myanmar, uh, in Southeast Asia, the western part of the Southeast Asia, like Myanmar, so we have the Buddhist heritage from that uh, original Buddhist place. So this is for the one case study of the museum piece. It was collected in the Pakan temple. So it is style of 12th century uh, Pakan depiction of the Buddha Nirvana, the great sea. So for the 11th century, the middle uh, medieval age of the Asia. So <laughs> in India, the transition, transitional uh, stage of the Buddhist iconography uh, may, may mostly uh, resemble to the Bagan style Buddha. So Pala style and the Bacan, Ali Bagan style is very uh, resemble and very uh, similar in this slide. So we can uh, look at the detail decoration about the uh, Buddha life and a Buddhist uh, canonical narrative style. 
So this is for the Bagan civilization. Bagan is, uh, was established in the 11th century to the 30th century, uh, uh, approximately 300 years long. It's civilized mainly based on the Buddhist tradition. Uh, Buddhist tradition succeeded, uh, succeeded, succeeded the Indian and the Gandhara, Mathura, uh, Gupta, and Pala, something like this. The Buddhist, most of the Buddhist society tried to build their uh, religious dedication and the uh, religious building with religious arts in their own <laughs> states and territory. Like this, in Bagan, we can see the three different types of uh, Buddhist school of art, especially for the, especially for the uh, iconography. So after uh, post Bagan period, so Bagan, we can we can uh, we can we can think Bagan is look like the uh, Bagan is look like the Kandara. So this period of post Bagan periods may look look like the Mathura or Gupta or Mapala, something like this. So <laughs> theoretically, the, the difference and the transformation of differentiate and transformation of the Bagan Buddhist a school of arts gradually transformed to the post-Bakan uh, post periods and the later periods. So you see the Inwa and Nyaoya and the very recent, very recent uh, style of the uh, Buddha statue, Buddha images is the Yadanabo, 19th century uh, CE. So for the conclusion, the post bakan period is very, <laughs> Uh, prominence for development in the Buddhist society, development among the Buddhist society. So uh, we, we can call the Pinya, Inwa Pinya period, Inwa period, Tongu, Nyaoyen, Kombao, Amrapura, something like this. Uh, for, the, for the many monarchy dynasty follow the Bagan style of Buddhist tradition. And uh, so in this, here we can we can think about the began uh, establish, establishment of the began Buddhist school of art. It is directly related to the uh, Mathura, uh, direct Mathura, uh, sorry, uh, Pala, Mathura, and Gandhara. So this uh, change and uh, this uh, transitional sequence of the Buddhist school of art and the Buddhist iconography are still developed in the Myanmar, uh, Myanmar Buddhist traditional society. So, so thank you for your attention and, and thank you for your <coughs> listening my presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Fin Fiu Chao. It was an interesting discourse from your end. Uh, moving on to our last panelist for this session, and then we will, of course, be interested to know what our discussants have to say. We will now invite Mr. E. Chao, the Managing Director and CEO of Fibuland Tourism Services Company since 1991, and Bridge Corporation, Myanmar. He will be discussing more about the religious tourism from the Myanmar perspective. Sir, please go ahead. Yeah, we'll have to. Okay. So thank you very much uh, for me to participate uh, in, in this uh, great event that Kandara Civilization and Buddhist Heritage of Pakistan, uh, organized by uh, IPRI, Istanbul uh, Policy Research Institute, and the Myanmar Institute of Strategic and International Study, MISIS. So, so then with my experience and knowledge, I would like to share about the, let's say about the tourism. So what we want to say about the tourism is on normally basis on the, you see, a religious tourism, because in, in this world, in the earth, Let's say we all are human beings as far well as the animals. We have legs. Legs mean that the legs is to travel. Yeah, travel. So, so that we have eyes. Eyes as we are to see. And then we have ears to listen. Okay. And then also we have to have a nose to smell. And we have to mouth and tongue to taste it. So then we have brain to 
to meditate. You get it. Okay, so that's the way the tourism is set up. So without the legs, we cannot travel. So we cannot tour around. Whatever the business tour or health tour or religious tour is depend on the lake. Okay, and then also on the, our eyes and also on our nose and ears, whatever, and also our brain. So that's why I want to show that body, mind and soul is very important for tourism. If we are not healthy, we are not travel. Okay, otherwise we have to sit in our office or maybe in our room or on the bed. So, so then we should have all healthy. And then another thing is for tourism itself, where we want to visit, the place should be secure and also be, we have the peace. If there is no secure, how can we travel? So that's a way. So, so with my understanding about that, you see, there are all major religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Christian, Islam, okay? Among these, Hinduism and Buddhism are originated in India, but three Buddhas were born in Lumbani, Kapila Bastu, yeah? So then in Nepal. So this is a place where our, our the, the last Buddha was born as a Sikh Buddha. You see, Kodama, we call it. He discovered Buddhism in we see 562, 483 to 483. So over the next millennia, Buddhism spread across Asia and the rest of the world. Buddhists believe that human life is a circle, suffering and rebirth. But that if one achieves a state of alignment, Nirvana, we call it, it is possible to escape this life cycle forever. So our Lord Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama was the first person to reach a state of alignment Nirvana and was and still today known as the Buddha. Buddhists do not believe in any kind of deity and or God, although there are supernatural figures who can help us or hinder people on the path towards alignment Nirvana. So then for this okay, so anyhow we should understand that Sekata Kodama was an Indian prince but he is not an Indian prince. Actually, he is a Nepalese prince. At that time, we don't call him as an India. We call him, you see, the, we have the, our, our name there. See, then we call it, the ancient name is Marga. Marga. So there is no India. There is no Pakistan. There is no Nepal. There is no Sri Lanka. There is no Burma. No Myanmar. No China. So we have to start from the Stone Age. Okay, we have to go back. To our last last civilization before the this whatever we call the civilized when we become a civilized before we human being come out where we started so we have to go back to the ages okay this depends on the so i'm not an engineer or historian but i'm just a tourist i'm also only a traveler i'm just started the tourism in 1968 so that at the time i was I was about 70 and so just I, I'm going to sit for my examination. Then after my examination for matriculation, I start the tourism as a as a driver for the tourists and as an interpreter. I'm not a guy that yet, but with my knowledge about I travel a lot and I know many people around the world. So and then since I love to travel, so then I know that. Buddha, he himself loved to travel. That's why Buddha is traveling. You see, Buddha is traveling. Okay, so then, uh, where? Start from his life, uh, Kodama, from nobody, Kabila Vastu. So then, even at his birth, what is the Buddha just came out from his mother? My name, we call it. So then, He's just step seven step. That means that he walked. So means that our legs is for walking. Walking is a good exercise as well as hygiene. If we have a leg and we don't walk, what will happen? Even though we travel by flight or whatever, by cruise or ship or whatever, you see, by car, 
But when we stay down, then we have to go walk, walk to the stairs, walk to Shiro, we have to climb some temples. Then we have to go to see the mountains also walking. Okay? Wherever we want, we need to walk. So that's why I want to say that traveling or tourism is the traveling is a walking. It's a walking tourist. So that's why now walking street in all over the world is happening. Yeah. So people want to walk. They want to walk in the garden. Okay. So what is? So that a bit that. So of what I want to basically want to tell you is religious tourism. Religious tourism is, is something like that. Touring based on the religion. That's why that I want to say that for the Hindu, Hindu also they want. They have the Hindu tourism, Kebabali, whatever, you see, so Hindu. So all the lots, what they cost, whatever, they travel also. And also about the Christian, Christian also walking. You see, Jesus Christ has to walk. And also, let's say Muhammad, okay, Muhammad also for Islam is walking. Because the more he walks, then he can, he can what uh, he, he, he can explain his the religion, the Christian or Hindu, or maybe Islam. Also the Buddha, our Buddha, the Lord Buddha. Also walk. Walk from where? Walk from Nepal. Let's say now I'm geographical. Now it's Nepal. Then he went to India. He went to where? Then he get an alignment. Where? Both died. So so that's the way the alignment comes. Then he knows about the Buddhism. Buddhism, he, our Lord Buddha said, he, he said he's not a god. He's just a preacher. He's telling us he's like a lecturer or professor. Then one, the taxi lab. He just walked from there and then walked from where? And then to, he passed by the way to Bangladesh also and to Pakistan also. Then from Pakistan, then comes to Arakan, Rakhai. Rakhai and those three, you can believe it because the, the Buddha came to Arakan and at the time the king was his friend in the past life. So he came in and gave his blessing uh, for, for, for the Bronx building. We call it Mahamuni. Okay? Mahamuni is also discussed by the Bronx, but now is now in Mandarin. But the Rakhine and Rakhine said the real Mahamuni. Kindly check for the connection. Um, it seems the main office is disconnected. Uh, is, it could be uh, electrical electrical problem. Mm -hmm. be. <laughs> uh, I suppose we could wait for a few minutes before we move on to our discussant, Mr. Shahid Kiani, who's also waiting. It seems that uh, yes, MSIS has been disconnected. So their office, uh, electrical, electric, electric city is off. <laughs> uh, I suppose we could then move on with our discussion, Mr. Shahid Kiani, who has uh, who is the former ambassador to Vietnam. Sir, since you're present, uh, present, we could continue with the discourse. And as the office of MISIS joins us for a conclusion later. Uh, Ambassador Shahid Kiani, you will have to unmute your mic. Ambassador, are we um, audible to you? Yes, we are. Yes, okay, okay. yes, you are. Please go ahead. Okay, I'll be very brief. Uh, first of all, I'm extremely grateful to the president of Islamabad Positive Institute, uh, Dr. Raza, the ambassador, Dr. Raza, for, for inviting me. Uh, let me just say 
very frankly that uh, this is has been a very very impressive uh, even though uh, very there were very few speakers but the range of the information on buddhism is absolutely mind blowing and i'm extremely grateful to first of all dr nadeem umar and the participant uh, from from myanmar mr kayo of i i hope i'm not misspelling his name i think we are now prepared for to up to about just my request for a larger for example like an international conference on buddhism my own just few uh, things which i need to add is i have been posted to vietnam and then was also credited to myanmar to to laos then travel to bhutan i was in bangladesh nepal thailand cambodia all these countries where you have the footprints of the buddhist heritage this is a little unfortunate that in pakistan i was just looking at the extremely impressive presentation by dr tarad i must commend him for having uh, given us the background the stamps in which you know at the time when we were very proud of our heritage it is unfortunate that in our country uh, we tend to look at our history just with mohammed bin qasim and then we don't want to go uh, you know in the the uh, in thousands of years back because uh, this is something of which many countries are proud of i'll give you example in vietnam they fought a very uh, very bitter war with the french but if you go and and look at uh, their the way they have preserved the the monuments of that period you go to any other country people are very 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 proud but unfortunately here we do not have uh, for example we have the footprints all over pakistan as dr tarad was was showing us but what are we doing about it the uh, they have the for example the french and the italian archaeologists have helped pakistan in discovering uh, more of the footprints of buddhism the buddhist heritage in our country but we are unfo- unable to take advantage of it the mo- problem is if you go to the museums our museums are very well stocked but to attract the young people you need to have some sort of a video very well prepared videos in these uh, uh, these museums so that the younger people they uh, also look at these um, uh, the uh, what you call statues and other which are lying there the artifacts but they need to also uh, have the younger people or uh, the modern age they need to look at a the videos prepared of the heritage in pakistan and other places then the textbooks in the schools must be must we must yeah, educate our children as to our very rich heritage it's extremely important important meaning i do not understand as to why we in in pakistan we get scared of talking about other religions meaning are we so fragile is our own religion so fragile that we cannot even talk about other religions so this is something we if we are look at what's happened in afghanistan the bamiyan and others i think this is very unfortunate what happened this there there should not be any repeat of that uh dr ramesh was talking about the security i think it's very important that the heritage the, the tourists who come to this country should be given security now another important thing is are uh, we have the, the airports i think all our airports should have these the big you know uh, photographs or uh, of the heritage site both the charity sites the museums welcoming the the, uh, the the tourists and let the tourists know that this this heritage we are proud of our heritage so the, uh, this was this conference very briefly a timely conference i remember when in vietnam there was a conference on buddhism and i volunteered to speak i remember that many of my uh, colleagues from the other embassies were quite surprised the islamic republic of pakistan's ambassador and then uh, they were they, they were i remember getting i was commended by the nepali and the indian ambassador for speaking on buddhist heritage of pakistan we should be proud of and the recommendation given that our embassies abroad should be also should should promote this 
This can only be done, you know, we can do our homework provided, provided the uh, wherewithal is in Pakistan. If we start promoting heritage in, in our embassies, no problem. But then would they find this thing when they come to this country? Would, would, uh, are, are, are you ready to welcome the, the, the tourists from, from abroad? For example, the security, for example, the, are the tourists, the, the tourist companies are, would be help and assist them. So all these things are extremely important. And um, before I end, I would once again say, sir, it won't take much time, that, that sir, to talk to, to uh, Dr. Raza and the other colleagues, extremely well done. And sir, one last suggestion is that I, we need to invite the cultural attaches, the ambassadors uh, of, uh, who are here, especially from, from those countries where the Buddhist footprints are there. And then the French and the Italian archaeologists, the embassies here, who should be able to come and, and look as to what we have started doing. Thank you very much, sir, for inviting me. And I'm extremely grateful to IPRI for having honored me. Thank you so much, sir, for your remarks. Uh, seeing that the main office of MISI is back, uh, I would like to request the closing remarks from Chairman MISIS. I hope we're audible to you. I would like to know if we are audible to the main team at MISIS. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Yes, Hello. sir. Can you asking. hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Can asking. you hear me? Yes, okay. sir. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. So I'm from MISIS, Mrs. Uh, I'm HO again. I'm sorry for that. Uh, for for we have some sort of a power problem connection. Huh? Now I'm using my laptop to continue. Okay. So so can can I continue back? Please please. Okay. Thank you. So then, uh, as a tour operator, uh, HR, uh, I myself, you see, I I travel a lot. You see, even I attend the meeting. Uh, you see, uh, in uh, conf in a trade and promotion promotion conference in Calcutta, India, in two thousand nine, there I I was attended together with our His Excellency uh, Utan Cho. Uh, at that time, he I, uh, he was a Director General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I was a tour operator, and I from the from the Tourism Association. So then I have a chance to meet with all the Buddhist okay, uh, tour operator from, from, let's say from, from India, from Nepal, from Pakistan, from Sri Lanka, and from Thailand. So let's say all, Uh, Buddhist country, we were there, meet with others, operator. So then I have a chance to, to attend the EU plus Asia conference in 2011 in Brussels, Belgium. That time, uh, His Excellency Udanjo, he was the ambassador for Myanmar in Belgium. So that time, I have a chance to speak out about the tourism. So why, how tourism is very important because tourism itself is religious purpose and also friendly purpose and for the trade purpose. So forever, the tourism is very important because tourism can make peace. Tourism can make friendship. Tourism can make business, whatever, relationship between each other and understanding between other religion also. Let's say, for example, let's say I'm saying that you see the Christian tourists going to Vatican and they go to Jerusalem for the Christian tourism. As well as for the Muslim tourists, 
he wants to go to so Makkah. Okay, so that is the one travel. For the Hindu also, they go to wherever the Hindu festivals are there, they go there. So they want to travel. As a, we as a Buddhist, you see, we want to travel to India, to Nepal, to Sri Lanka. Okay, now I to China, also to Japan and Korea also. So because Myanmar Buddhists are very strong in Asia, let's say Myanmar is the biggest Buddhist country in the world. For this, that we want to exchange tourism between Pakistan and Myanmar for tourism trade. That's why now we understand that from this, you see, Evan, from this okay, webinar, I understand that there are a lot of Buddhist heritage in Pakistan. So whenever, so we want to travel to Pakistan, we can organize the Buddhist tourists. Buddhist tourists means that not only we laymen, also the monks, okay? And also, but for this, we are a little bit aware of that because of, we, I already told you about that. For tourism, we need peace and secure. So secure for our health, uh, secure of our standing, uh, living or traveling. That is very important. Health and traveling. Okay. okay. And secure for our living. So accommodation. So secure of our transportation. So whenever we travel, we want to be safe. So this, all the humans want to be safe when they are traveling. So then for this, uh, I, I think the, you see the Pakistan government and the people from all over the world, not only Pakistan, all over the world, the airline should be safe to travel to one place to another place. Then also when Myanmar traveling to India, mostly we go to Bodh Gaya for Buddhist circuit. See, we go there. We go to Nepal, we go to Sri Lanka, we go to India. Okay, well, so we are trying a lot. So for that, and also Myanmar people are very generous. Mostly they generous in religion. But the generous is sometimes if they have, for example, that 100, let's say $100. Say from $100, they only keep $10 for themselves to eat and survive. The other $90, they contribute and donate. Mostly to for the religion, they do it. So then for this kind of a, the heritage site in Pakistan or to restore again. So we Myanmar Buddhists, I, we can encourage them to travel to you, but you have to give the secure traveling. And for our accommodation also, we, we accommodate, it should be cheap because Myanmar are not a rich people, but any, they are rich of generosity. For well, that is, we people can, can, can contribute or donate, not only to the, for the religion, but also for the people of Pakistan. Then we also want to, you, you see, a win-win. So we coming to Pakistan or China or whatever, or India or Nepal, or, or to Thailand, we want to help a little bit uh, cheap, not we are not not the cheap. Means that it's cheaper. Cheaper means that so then we can organize it. So when we go visit India, there are monastery that accept the pilgrimage tours to sleep there, to go and make there, and also for eating also food, not at the restaurant. So that's how they can keep save the money, but they can contribute more than more than for the traveling to the Buddha side also. So for this, I would like to speak up about it for on behalf of not only for Myanmar, also for other, other, uh, you see, re religious tourism side. You see, village those coming, the tourists, you should give a special privilege or chances for them, for, for the visa also. So the visa also, so then some country give us a visa free for the religious tourism. That is the way we can help each other. So the world is now 
it's a it's a global it's a village we we don't want to discriminate between the colors of the skin or the car or those the, the position of the people but people are people humans are human we are all same we don't need to criticize about other religion so then that, that's the way we should have make a friend a friendly we want to i want to make peace in this world i don't want to make war in this world you see so we have to afraid that we are nearly according to the buddha buddhism said you see also the prophet said or christian said now the world is facing a lot of problem by climate problem and by by hungerness and for, for the diseases so then we call it cut you see so there is a cast you see so then because of this three cast we are on the edge of the end of the wall so nearly to be end it the wall is then the, the wall have to start again see the whole have to start again so they when the wall have to start means that we are living on this earth in the world in the universe see there are other other many universe that the buddha said you see so that for that then we have start again and rebuild again and no more human or animals alive so then we have to start again from the new wall a new new universe a new earth so then i would like to share my knowledge to everybody that okay so then i want to you to to know about that how is we can promote about the religious tourism so i hope that we all the listeners or who are participant or maybe who are listening or the speakers okay so i want to share my knowledge to you and also i want to get your knowledge to share me back as well and also and so for this time okay so to, for this you see that okay uh, uh, because uh, i i want to conclude about my uh, discussing about the religious tourism so i hope that you understand because of the discernment of power uh, uh, we lost our time anyhow it's just a brief if you want to share more knowledge with with me or with my superior uh, utanjo and his mis people always i thank all to you to to participate in this webinar as a speaker as a tourism company thank you very much thank you okay thank you so much mr hr for such an in depth um presentation on religious tourism and certainly with this uh, webinar we understand the importance of the of the fact that the heritage that pakistan has goes beyond the country and it could be one of the factors of bringing regional integration in in the region as well with that being said i would like to call uh, chairman misis for his closing remarks i hope we are audible to you sir thank you yeah i think i got your voice hello hello sir you are audible to us as well please go yes, ahead yes for yes 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 okay uh, thank you <clears throat> today uh, the co of our uh, discussion is to exchange of culture architecture and promoting religious tourism as well as bringing two peoples uh, friendship <clears throat> the fast changing world of today politics trade and business building up the understanding of culture religion color and background situation of politics must be handled with patience and tolerance for that our think tanks should take forefront mysis would like to continue working with the think tanks like you as well i thank the speakers the participants for the successful seminar today also big thanks to dr raza and the team of ipri I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, for your remarks. It was a pleasure to host you. For closing remarks from April, we will now call upon Chair Economic Security, Dr. Neil Salman. Thank you, Javeria, and. Uh... it has been a wonderful session 
like a travelogue about uh, Buddhism and how we can promote it in the region. But I'll just uh, point out two or three uh, things about it. But when you look at the Buddhist philosophy, it's more focused on two principles, that is simplicity and nonviolence. And what we have seen that in Gandhara, it has been a well-developed society in terms of its location like India, Persia, and China, and that has been the center of the travel routes. Now, uh, even Islam entered, entered through these routes, and uh, what we see that we focused on the cultural tourism or the religious tourism, and we also listened about some of the frictions that not, uh, stops tourists or how the tourism can be promoted over here. But overall, I think the cusp is that uh, what happens to the economy. And I think when you look at the Buddhist economy, which in 1966, Schumacher in his book, The World is uh, Small is Beautiful. And what he talks about is that no matter Either you're doing it through cultural tourism, you're doing it from trade, it boils down to two major principles. One is sustainability, and the other one is shared prosperity, and the last one is compassion. And I think that differentiates uh, Buddhist economy from the market economies, which makes it uh, much distinct. A lot of work has to be done in the region, and uh, if the, these kind of communication and dialogues are uh, in process. They are in line. I think people's perception about uh, the country itself, Pakistan, and talking about it, how this uh, Buddhist uh, civilization has improved the economy. It has improved the social fabric. It has improved the cultural infinity. Uh, affinity. That makes it much more remarkable. With this, uh, thank you. We would now like our senior research fellow, Ambassador Asif Tarani, for his word of thanks and then present memento to our guest, Dr. Nadine. Thank you, Javeria. And uh, since oh, President, uh, it's now my response. <laughs> Uh, Chairman Ambassador Han Cho and his uh, other colleagues. And uh, I am, I'm grateful to Dr. Carol for his trade horizon. We stand educated and uh, it's really uh, a great ex exploration, I would say, because uh, Buddhist tourism in Pakistan, rather, it is a mecca of uh, Buddhism. So it should have happened uh, many decades ago. But uh, in Farsi, we say, there I Durasayad. It's better late than never. So uh, it's uh, really uh, not only it was educative for, for me, um, but uh, from the geopolitical and geoeconomic pers uh, perspective, if you look at it, so it is, it uh, it can be a win-win situation for all the nations, uh, especially where the Buddhists uh, are in uh, great numbers. Uh, allow me to thank uh, everyone who had participated, and ladies and gentlemen, uh, I, I think you will share with me. Uh, you will agree with me in the kind of education we got today it was really very informative and uh, hope uh, this there will be a series of seminars uh, like we had with uh, uh, ISMIS and hope that we will continue the practice thank you so much and let me close the seminar thank you so much and uh, for the audience here please uh, like refreshment uh, please, you may present the memento to Dr. Nadeem. With, with this, I would like the audience to move towards refreshments. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining.